Well, thank you very much. You know, <clears throat> a number of years ago, I lived in France. I went to high school in France, and people would sometimes take me aside and say, tell me all about America. And um, <laughs> their, inter their interest was genuine, but it was a little hard to know where to start. And I feel that way a bit about the new economy movement. All of you have a connection to different pieces of it. And what I'm going to do is offer up a couple of observations about some of the structural questions that we're concerned with and I know you're concerned with, um, and then um, tell you a bit uh, about what the New Economy Coalition specifically is doing so that you have a sense of where our, our activity is focused. Um, in a way, this is like the trailer for the New Economy movie, um, or, or maybe you can think of it as, uh, as a web page where we can go back and click on different things that you want to talk about in greater depth. Um, uh, I don't expect everyone to know everything that I refer to, but I want to give you some sense of the extraordinary breadth of uh, what is happening. Um, the, the headline is that I think we're in the midst of a moment, an emergent moment, when hundreds, if not thousands, of new approaches to the economy, to politics, uh, to technology are bubbling up all around us, um, partly in response to people's very deep sense that there are structural, systemic uh, difficulties that we are running into and that are making themselves manifest uh, all around us. And we may not all have a sense of how they connect, that's part of the challenge, but we are seeing more and more evidence of this. And the good thing about um, uh, the United States is that people tend to be very pragmatic once they've identified a problem then they immediately asking themselves well what's the origin of this problem and how can we fix it. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with a little bit of good news. I've been in the field of environment, corporate responsibility, corporate accountability, investment, uh, all of that for a very long time now and some things have happened very quickly. I'm not going to um, go into them in great depth but if you're not familiar with this it's worth having a bit of a sense of, of history and uh, in addition to the various innovations that have taken place uh, technologically around the environment, um, there, have been, there has been an extraordinary shift in the thinking of uh, universities, of, um, uh, of businesses, of, of a whole variety of people. And you know, the organizations that I was involved with, Ceres is a coalition of environmental groups and big investors, uh, when it first got going in 1989, around the time of the Exxon Valdez accident, no businesses were interested in, in environment and sustainability except as a compliance question. And that has changed dramatically now. And we can debate what they're doing, how much they care, whether it makes a difference, and so forth. But the sheer volume of activity now uh, from the larger corporate sector is quite incredible. Um, not that long ago, there was no discussion uh, and no idea about how to measure a sustainability. And now we're seeing an explosion of people trying to figure out how to actually measure this for different entities, whether it's for governments or regions or particularly for corporations. I was the co-founder of the Global Reporting Initiative, a very big international organization. If you're not familiar with it, um, I urge you to become uh, familiar. Uh, it is a standard setting body to help corporations figure out how to measure and disclose their sustainability performance. And again, we can discuss in greater detail what its limitations are, where it needs to go, and so forth, but now 3,000 multinational companies use this. It's required by governments around the world, and that's something you, was really hard to imagine even 12 or, or 14 years ago. Um, I just got back from France. Um, uh, there is an organization called the Integrated, International Integrated Reporting Committee, and this is asking at the really the highest level globally, what is the relationship between financial measurement and disclosure and sustainability measurement and disclosure? Um, we now have corporations and others who are doing two kinds of disclosure, and there's really a fundamental issue about how they go together. And uh, the alphabet soup of the, all the groups that are involved in would, would alarm you um, but it includes all of the big accounting firms, all of the big uh, uh, securities uh, associations, the International Accounting Standards Board, the fi Financial Accounting Standards Board here in the U.S. And they're all asking some very fundamental questions. And one of the most interesting questions, which we're not going to discuss unless you want to come back to it, is what is the purpose of a business in uh, a planet, on a planet where we are becoming increasingly resource constrained? And the core discussion that's taking place is 
can we reconceive of business not as a mechanism that simply sucks in financial capital, turns around various activities, and then spits out financial results, which has been sort of the core model of capitalism for a long time, but instead asks, let's think of the, all the different forms of capital that are drawn in, the natural capital, social capital, intellectual capital, that are drawn in from the stocks that are available to a firm, and then churned around and then they have outputs. In some cases they are enhanced, in some cases they are depleted. But if you can imagine what would happen if all the big accounting societies in the world decided that they wanted to create a system that actually measured the inflow and outflow of these different forms of capital, that would change uh, fundamentally how we conceive of investment and business in the world. So that's, uh, that's happening very rapidly. Now the bad news, oh I want to mention two or three other quick things. Um, you know, Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg, which um, is you know, sort of the beating pulse of the uh, investor system, now puts sustainability information on all its uh, consoles that people are, and you know, a lot of analysts don't know how to use it and they don't know if it's important, but now that information is available and if you're a company that's not putting out uh, information, you start to feel it because there's a long row of blank things on your Bloomberg screen. And that feels very bad. So there's now an incentive. Um, there are all kinds of other groups that are stepping forward to ask fundamental structural questions. There's a very interesting book, and I'm going to be referring to a whole bunch of books um, that you might find interesting by a guy named John Elkington, a leader in sustainability in England. And he wrote a book called Zero Knots. And these are about people who are really interested, the business leaders, theorists, economists, who are really interested in designing systems that have zero physical uh, output. In other words, that generate um, uh, their value without creating waste. And this is a significant movement now um, that people are looking at all over the world. Um, if, you, um, if you go and you type in sustainability into Google, you're going to get 111 million hits, which is uh, also something that was may seem normal to you now. It was uh, not true just a few uh, years ago. Okay, now the problem, big problem, is that despite these changes that are taking place, there are these large structural problems that are intensifying. And they're intensifying at a pace um, that is frightening and calls for, for a response from us that we, um, that, that really means that what you're doing in thinking about this and being willing to tackle it is critically important. Uh, one of the overall themes of the whole new economy movement is the invisibility of certain problems and the invisibility of certain solutions that are emerging. Um, just as a matter of, just, just a matter, do, do you know how many um, businesses there are in the United States that have more than 500 employees? Anybody want to take a guess? Less than 1%. Well, in terms of total businesses, yes, that's correct, but just in absolute terms. 26,000. What? 26,000. 26,000 is an uh, order of magnitude correct guess, but it's 18,000. Now, so there are tens of millions of small businesses, one-person businesses, but those 18,000 get all the press and are assumed to have all the power. In many cases, they do have a lot of the power. But if you open up the business press or you look and you say, what's going on in the economy, what you get are endless, endless, endless stories about that same pool. About 8,000 of them are publicly traded. So you get an even endless, endless, endless debate about those 8,000. So it gives a very skewed idea of what an economy really is if you're focusing just on 18,000 500 companies out of uh, hundreds of thousands of medium-sized companies and literally millions of companies or uh, small businesses if you look at what Americans actually do to make a living. So, um, but so the big structural questions, now a lot of people, including Gus and others, wonderful, wonderful, brilliant people, spend most of their talk on the nature of the problems. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to flag them for you. I promise you we could jump in and go into great depth in each one, but I just and, and I'm not going to list them all because there are so many of them. But the ones that keep coming back for discussion in the new economy movement and so forth, one is the problem of inequality, fundamental inequality of both wealth and income in the United States, creating increasing structural distortions and how uh, resources flow and in politics, which we'll come back to. Um, 
income uh, rose 275 percent for the top one percent between 1979 and 2007, and it rose only 18 percent during that same period for the bottom uh, 20 percent. So we've had an explosion of income equality and an explosion of wealth uh, inequality. And what does that mean? It means that they, uh, all kinds of structures in society are being distorted as a result of this. We have problems in, under that general heading of, um, of uh, permanent unemployment, uh, people in marginalized communities who simply cannot find uh, jobs. This, we have a sort of problem of the throwaway city, where whole cities have been depleted, and then the people have been left behind. Um, I don't know how many of you happened to hear Al Gore when he was here about 10 days ago, but uh, you know he unleashed this incredible figure that the six offspring of the Walton family, the five kids and the one in-law, have more in their net worth than the bottom 100 million Americans. That is really an amazing idea. And uh, you don't have to feel one way or the other about the personalities of these people to realize that there's a structural problem. So there's uh, inequality, there's consumerism. We could talk a lot about consumerism. We're kind of trapped in a sorcerer's apprentice problem that consumer, um, uh, consumer activity is two thirds of our GDP. Um, and so we're constantly being exhorted to buy more stuff. And yet the problem is that the endless pursuit of more stuff is itself part of the problem, both in terms of research use, in terms of um, uh, all across the, uh, I'll stop there, we could go on for a long time. Um, unlimited growth, the idea that you uh, could have unlimited growth, um, I'm sure that Neva dealt with that when she was here, but it, this is being drawn more and more fundamentally into question. Paul Krugman, you know, who's not normally a radical uh, on many issues, uh, has really raised the question of whether 3% growth is going to be possible for the United States looking forward. Um, one of the most interesting things I heard uh, was a uh, a um, interview with Jeremy Grantham, one of the major hedge fund uh, people, uh, Grantham, Mayo, and, and Osterloo here in Boston, gave a wonderful, disturbing, but wonderful talk about the limits to growth. Um, you know, and he used the analogy that if you started with a cubic meter of stuff around the time of the Egyptians and it grew at 4.5% per year, um, by at this point the volume would equal the volume of the solar system. So, so um, expert, sort of the continued compounded growth is a problem, um, and either you try and pursue it, in which case you destroy more things at a faster rate, or you run into the limitations of it, in which case you have to ask fundamental questions about meeting uh, basic uh, human needs. So. Uh, the growth issue, I mean, Kenneth Boulding, the economist, has this great quote, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And so, okay, um, another big issue, broken finance on Wall Street. We could uh, spend quite a bit of time on that. Uh, we really have shifted from a system that invests capital in real things, in the real economy, into a kind of casino mentality, and the casino mentality um, is really incredible. It's like if I bet and I lose, then you pay. Um, and that tends to encourage betting. Um, so, um, and we could go into, if you're interested, you know, we have had multiple collapses. It isn't just that we had the subprime, subprime lending, collateralized debt obligations, all the different issues that have caused wealth to disappear, but we've been through three of them in the last 15 years. And you know each gets bigger than the last, so we tends to wipe out. But in the early part of 2000, we lost 4.3 trillion dollars in wealth in the United States because of things like, uh, you know, the the uh, dot com bubble, tech bubble, um, the collapse of WorldCom, Enron, you know, companies that may uh, distantly uh, appear in in your uh, memories. Um, what that has meant is that median wealth in the United States has fallen, median household wealth has fallen from $126,000 to $77,000. So what that means is half the people in the United States, if you add up everything they have, their homes, their cars, everything that they've uh, built up, uh, they have less than $77,000, and that includes their retirement income. So that's a really scary uh, problem. If, if Wall Street can strip uh, and redistribute in such an effective way. And then, again, I'm sure Neva talked about broken economics. We'll just pass over that quickly, but the idea of GDP, efficient markets, all the things that no longer actually allow us to map uh, what's really happening. 
Um, I don't know if you any. There's a very old movie called Around the World in 80 Days with David Niven, and David Niven is determined to make uh, make a race get all the way around the world. And as he comes across the United States, uh, from the United States across the Atlantic, he's in a ship, and he realizes the ship isn't going fast enough. So what he does is he tells the captain that he has to tear everything off the ship. Uh, that isn't that except what the, the actual boat keeping itself afloat but everything every chair everything and put it in the furnace so it'll go faster and i think that's a great image about what we've been doing in other words burning fundamental capital stripping down what we have in order to go a little bit faster to win some kind of crazy race and so that's uh that's a real problem and then broken democracy i've uh, been involved in politics for a long time and um, we have seen a real deterioration and how politics works in the United States. Now, okay, so that's the quick overview. Now, the new economy, um, there are some people who approach all this and they begin to adopt apocalyptic thinking, you know, that the only thing that's going to happen is something awful. And you see that on the right and you see that on the left. Um, and I suppose the, that anyone who goes down that path can present plenty of evidence uh, I don't want to go down that path because I think it's disempowering. I think it strips people of the opportunity to really engage. But I, it's a deep strain in America right now is that this is all headed off the cliff and, um, uh, and there's enough evidence of that for us to worry. But there's an alternative element which is we can do this better. And the names, you know, we've made, we've compiled names. New economy, solidarity economy, sharing economy, resilient economy gift economy, sustaining economy, provisioning economy, restorative economy, regenerative economy, caring economy, and collaborative economy. The interesting thing is, when you think about that, they're all kind of related. I mean, you sort of know what they mean, even if they're not really clear. What it means is a system where the inputs and the outputs are somehow balanced to meet real human needs, and not uh, simply uh, uh, a system tearing itself apart and tearing the people in it apart. Um, and one of, there's an interesting quote in an article by a, a gentleman named Ethan Miller. He talks about this isn't about coming up with a, a single theory that everyone's going to embrace and then we're going to get it right. And then we're all going to adopt it and we're going to get it right. Um, he talks about, uh, in his, his case he uses the term solidarity economy. He says, beginning from a core belief that people are deeply creative and capable of developing their own solutions to economic problems and that these solutions will look different in different places and contexts, a solidarity economy approach seeks to make existing and emerging alternatives visible. See, there's that visible again, so we can see them and take hope and learn from them and then to link them to go on in mutually supportive ways. The core idea, he continues, is simple. Alternatives are everywhere, and our task is to identify them and connect them in ways that build a coherent and powerful social movement for another economy. In this way, solidarity economy is not so much a model of economic organization as it is a process of economic organizing. It's a process that we're engaged with, and it is not a single vision, but an active process of collective visioning. So the gerund is important here, that it is a process that we commit ourselves to and through which we discover a range of activities. Now, uh, again, I'm just going to mention that Who the... Who said that? Uh, this is Ethan Miller in his uh, article called Solidarity Economy Concepts and Issues, and I've forgotten the name of the book uh, in it, but you can find it on the internet really quickly. It came out in 2010. Now, maybe we can come back. I have some great members of the New Economy team here, and we can talk about areas in which these kinds of innovations are taking place. But we know that these innovations are taking place in the whole food system area. And um, some of you may know far more about that than me, but there are really interesting attempts now to rethink uh, how we get from farm to table. Um, energy. Uh, the all the different ways in which people are rethinking either saving energy, retrofitting uh, to uh, new forms of public utilities, to new forms of distributed energy, a lot of creativity on the ground. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Jeremy Rifkin. Jeremy Rifkin just came out with a new book on distributed energy, which he compares to um, a, a system developing comparable to the internet, uh, where you actually uh, develop localized sources of energy and then you redistribute it very rapidly without having huge centralized power plants. 
uh, business. There are business groups now that are really tackling new things. The Business Alliance for Living Local Economies. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday with their wonderful uh, executive director, Michelle Long. There are 30,000 small businesses working on projects. The American Sustainable Business Council is working on um, all different kinds of uh, 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 new policy recommendations for state and federal level. Um, and that's leaving aside all those other businesses who are stumbling forward in the general area of sustainability. Finance. People are exploring new forms of finance, public banking, community currencies, uh, community development finance initiatives, which there are already 950 in the U.S. There are 7,600 credit unions in the United States, which is a different form of finance. And, um, uh, and then new forms of job creation, new forms of land and uh, housing arrangements, especially the notion of the land trust, and then governance. People are really interested in exploring alternative forms of governance. One of the ways to think about this is that if capital has taken over our democracy in certain ways, what Al Gore said the other day is that uh, democracy has been hacked, which is an interesting way of putting it. If capital has hacked democracy, one of the challenges we face is how can we reintroduce democracy into capital? And I think that's a, and there are many interesting uh, organizations developing and um, uh, that people are exploring, cooperatives, land trusts, um, local venture capital, B corporations, all kinds of uh, issues around the retention and leasing of public lands, uh, hybrid public-private um, uh, uh, firms, and so forth. The other thing I want to mention, those are by topic, you know, food, finance, and things like that. But there's also regional areas, ecosystems where people are coming together to work uh, and to try and and try and understand each other to create the interconnected web that is an economy. And so very, uh, re really remarkable things happening in Vermont, uh, where you have all different kinds of groups working on all of these pieces and realizing that in a state with 600,000 people, they can really make some progress. They have the support of the governor, the support of the former treasurer, who's now the head of the uh, uh, Secretary of Administration, and they're trying to put together what would a new economy look like in terms of policy, practice, markets, investment, funding in a particular region. Uh, one of our uh, team members, Shanna Weber, is deeply involved with an uh, excellent group called Solidarity NYC, which is also right in the heart of New York City, trying to explore the creation of a uh, new economy web, interconnected web of groups. Um, and there are many other places in Maryland and Oregon and so forth. I don't even know all of them. I'm still, you know, I've only been in my job less than a year and I feel like I stumble across a whole new ecosystem of new economy activity every time I come out. There's activities in Boston right now and we, some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, we can come back to that. There are great books on this. One of the things that uh, um, I wish I could do is if I could, you know, get people who write for major publications to read about five or ten of the wonderful books there are out there. Going back to Bill McKibben's book on deep economy back in 2008, Neva Goodwin's textbooks, John DeGraff's book called What's the Economy For Anyway, um, Tim Jackson's book on prosperity without growth, uh, Francis Moore LePay wrote a book called Changing the Way Eco Minds, Changing the Way We Think to Create a World We Want. Gus Speth, who you met, um, his wonderful America the Possible. Agar Alperovitz, who I'm going to talk about a bit more, just coming out with a book uh, in May called What Then Must We Do? Which is full, and I know he's coming to speak to you. What an amazing man, full of great ideas and some very specific strategies to turn this from a set of imaginary activities into real activities. Now I'm going to skip forward, um, just mention very briefly, Obviously, and you're aware of this, the internet plays an incredible role and is redefining relationships in ways that I think people still, you, you'd think we have mastered it, we have not. I mean, there are still so many extraordinary changes. Um, and just to mention a few things, you're all familiar with the divestment movement, 230 campuses, you know, blown across the United States in a very short amount of time, partly because of the internet. Um, Groups like Avaz, which is an international uh, uh, um, campaigning organization, 15 million members of uh, people who focus on specific issues and specific action. Um, they're the changing questions of scale, the way a company, uh, some of you may be familiar with Etsy. Etsy allows local people, local craftspersons, 
to sell to larger regional or national markets. So it takes out all those physical limitations that uh, were at the core of economics for a very long time. And then Zipcar, peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, uh, uh, shareable.net, the whole collaborative consumption model, really, really interesting stuff where people are bypassing the idea of ownership in order to get use out of products in shared internet-driven ways. Fascinating things. Um, and we work in the Cambridge Innovation Center, just down 500 small companies, all trying to think, you know, in a, on a couple of floors, ranging from people dreaming up the next Google, the companies that are well established, um, busy trying to figure out what their role is. Now, many of them are based on a financing model that's an old school financing model, get venture capital and keep going. But still, the innovation that's taking place now is incredible. Now, what are we doing at the New Economy Coalition? We're doing a lot of New Economics Institute as it transitions in uh, name to the New Economy Coalition. Well, first of all, uh, we're developing networks. And um, we had an incredible college uh, conference at Bard College conf uh, last June. We had 300 organizations there. And one of the things that was most exciting was that people showed up and they said, oh my god, I had no idea there were so many other people doing similar or even different things. And speaker after speaker after speaker got up and said, the new economy is not some distant thing in the future. It already exists, but we're not visible to each other. We need to figure out how to work together. And uh, the phrase that I used in my stirring speech was that we can see the forest because we are the trees. I mean, the trees that are growing up right now. So that was exciting. And one of the questions that we struggle with every day is how you take that uh, richness of a community and how you help people see each other and support each other in new ways. And we're a small organization, relatively new, in, but we are thinking of all kinds of uh, cool things. Now we combined with the New Economy Network, which was another similar group, so we've now merged. The outcome of that is the New Economy uh, Coalition, um, and they had a membership group. We're doing these student uh, summits, this uh, our, our campus uh, network project, which um, I don't know how much of you know about it. MIT, of course, we're delighted that MIT is part of this process. When we put out the RFP for this, which was during exam week, we put out the RFP and we got 72 colleges and universities across the country looking for our relatively small grants so that they could launch a discussion of the new economy on their campuses. And these were not all Northeastern. They were from uh, Northeastern schools. They were from around the country, from Arizona, from um, uh, North Carolina, from Hawaii, from all different kinds of places. There was a hunger that we immediately became aware of that's very exciting and that we hope this year's New Economy uh, Campus Network uh, activity, and we have the organizers, uh, NEI uh, NE organizers here today, we can talk about that. We hope that will expand. Um, we have a convergence, which is where we're going to bring student organizers from and community organizers from those uh, events and to meet in New York City, about 300 people, to meet with new economy leaders so that we can plan 2013 and 2014. This is, you know, when you're talking about a movement, what you want is momentum and you want interconnectedness and you want people to already, even when they're doing A, to be dreaming about B and to be imagining C and to have a good idea of what they'd like to uh, see when they get to D. So. Um, we're doing that. We are hoping, and this is something that hasn't been fully discussed by our coalition, which is still in formation, by our board, we're hoping to do some kind of uh, all-in um, New Economy Action Week or New Economy Week in October. Uh, one of the things that I've been saying is that Columbus Day has kind of lost all meaning. It's a highly contested uh, uh, um, holiday. I would love us to reclaim that period that Columbus Day and talk about discovering the real United States, what's really going on, and have every group that sees itself as a new economy group do programming and make itself visible in the same week. We can come back and talk about that, but imagine what that would look like if everybody acted at the same time and they all went, like at Bard College, they all went, oh my god, I can't believe I said, you know, I had no idea this was all there. And then we want to be thinking about 2014. There's also, as we are trying to figure out exactly how to connect to these important local organizing efforts, on the ground grassroots efforts, whether it's in New York City, whether it's in Boston, whether it's in Vermont. 
So I'm just going to wrap up here by um, reading, uh, just mentioning a couple of the strategies that Gar talks about in his book, and then I hope you will discuss with him. But he, uh, one of the things that's great about Gar is that he has a clear vision of where he wants to go, but he is not, he doesn't imagine that we're going to get there without a lot of hard work. And one of the things that he, so he talks about four particular strategies. I'm just going to flag them for you. One is about the, the system strategies that democratize wealth. And he refers to this as evolutionary reconstruction. So this is creating institutions in local communities that have uh, more democratic control or more democratic input in the creation of models that provide goods and services. And he discusses that at some length. He also discusses the importance, when you look at it nationally, of what he refers to as a checkerboard strategy. You're not going to pass one law. You know, Washington is really fundamentally broken, and there's so much <laughs> resistance built up there. But if you pass things, if you start to create things in a sort of checkerboard pattern, then you don't have to look very far to look over and say, oh my gosh, this is happening just next to me. Why can't I do that where I am? And then you can start to fill in that checkerboard or hopscotch across that checkerboard because of these growing ecosystems. Here, I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, a checkerboard of ecosystems. Um, uh, so that people begin to see the realities and it becomes visible again. Um, he talks about crisis transformation. And this is something very important and that you really need to flag. When you get to, you know, involved in movement building for 30 years or so, 35 years, what you see is that there are moments when everything blows up and everything goes up into the air for a little while and it really matters if you have an idea of how you want it to come back down. Now we had the Dodd-Frank bill and frankly, we as a movement, sustainability, were not adequately prepared for that. When it all blew up in the air and Congress was like, oh quick, what ideas do we have? Let's put it, what are we going to require companies to do? And, you know, they threw in things like conflict metals, and they threw in whatever they could find or whoever brought it up, but there was not a comprehensive vision of the new economy or sustainability that could be brought forward in that moment of crisis. Gar talks about the health care uh, crisis. Ongoing. We may have Obamacare. We're still sucking up between 18 and 20 percent of our GDP on health care. That is a serious problem. It's going to continue to be a problem. And at some point, there is going to be a crisis around it. And we need to be prepared to speak to that, to what a system that is no longer driven by insurance companies and so forth might look like. Similarly, banking. I mean, you know, virtually everyone who studies the banking system uh, knows that Banks have gotten, particularly the big banks, have gotten bigger. Um, you know, Elizabeth Warren did a wonderful job the other day uh, grilling people, saying not only are they too big for fi to, to fail, they're too big for trial. Even when they break the law, they no longer get put on trial. So we have to be ready for that. And then he talks about displacement, which is that as new alternatives emerge, then people can turn to them in their consumer choices, mayors can turn to alternatives in their local communities rather than having to buy from some dominant or be under the pressure of some dominant force. So wealth de democratization, checkerboard, crisis transformation, and displacement, all really interesting ideas. So I'm just going to uh, wrap up with a quote, another quote from Kenneth Boulding. He said, the human condition can almost be summed up in the observation that whereas all experiences are of the past, all decisions are about the future. And it is the great task of human knowledge to bridge this gap and to find those patterns in the past which can be projected into the future as realistic images. And I would add, to innovate so that we're not just taking received wisdom and projecting it forward, but that we're actually inventing a future that we want. Um, you may think this is a big task. Humanity has faced big tasks before. This is why the people who are engaged with new economy work, uh, as tough as this is, I think often come to feel that this is a moment of historic opportunity and really a historic privilege. And every single person in here can make a contribution to this, a unique contribution to this. And I just want to ask you to consider it both an opportunity, a privilege, and a duty <coughs> to take that on. Thank you. Great.
so we can open it up for discussion now. Um, feel free to direct questions to Bob about his talk, about anything you have still lingering, and also feel free to respond to your colleagues' questions. And also, could I just ask my uh, team members from the New Economy um, Coalition to introduce themselves? So, Farzana. Uh, my name is Farzana, and I'm the online communications intern working on social media. I'm Eli. Um, I'm the communications and online organizing manager. Um, also live streaming right now. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a campus network organizer. I'm Rachel Plattis. I'm an organizing and development manager at NEI, um, working in the cyber program. And I'm Mike Sanmel. I'm also a campus network organizer uh, working both here at MIT and, and uh, elsewhere. And just so that you know, I spend most of my day just trying to find out and keep up with all the great stuff that they're doing. So they're the people that you really want to talk to if you are interested in connecting with what we're doing. So anyway, open it up. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for kind of this overview of what's going on. I think most people who, are, who come to these events have ex been exposed to a couple of, a couple of the, 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 the subset of what you've mentioned. And one of my fears is that a lot of this displacement theory of change that we're all engaged in, it's, it, it's going to invoke a backlash from the large incumbent institutions. So, you know, part of a credit union, I've been part of MIT Federal, Federal Credit Union from the moment I came to MIT in August 2003, and I think it's amazing, and I think everybody should do it. And, but, you know, then there was a moment of fear, of, you know, a couple of years ago when Credit unions were under siege by the large banks. They were going to lose some sort of status at the federal level. And people who want to start new credit unions want just to engage with the community. But they have to deal with you know, making themselves viable at the small scale, but also fighting off you know, incumbent power. And, and I, it, it, a part of the resources available from the movement to, to do that is this responsibility of kind of accumulation uh, that, that's going on in the coalition. Well, um, I'm sure most of you have studied the problem of regulatory capture and how many laws are structured precisely to favor the most powerful people in an industry. And that's not just laws, it's subsidies are created to favor the most powerful industry. So that makes it very difficult to create change. Um, the, there's no easy answer to your question. That's why it's a struggle. But at the same time, um, you do see things that start to change and that uh, one, one of the things about being part of an existing power structure is that you tend to be very comfortable where you are and you're not worried about people coming along and doing anything differently. And so I can tell you I've been involved in a number of major national and international movements where um, the, uh, the sort of powers that be, uh, the powers that defend the status quo, are just caught off guard. They're caught, you know, things start to bubble up and before they know it, it's kind of gotten out of hand. And then they try and suppress it, but it can be hard to do. So I think that's kind of what we have to do. There's, uh, you know, I'm frustrated by the invisibility that I mentioned, but it's also, in a sense, tactically uh, an opportunity. Like, let's get as much stuff done before anybody starts paying attention to it. Um, and then they'll all kind of wake up and go, hey, when did this happen? The other thing is that you have to allow for some people to make the uh, calculation, and this is a tricky thing, uh, that they, you know, if they can't beat it, they join it. And then you face the problem with these immense allies saying, oh, we're a new economy too. I was talking to one of our uh, people today, you know, if we have this new economy week, what happens if Bank America says, you know, we're a new economy too. Um, uh, but that's a danger that, I mean, th this is the nature of social and economic and political change, is that you get into that struggle. I just uh, I had a lot of involvement in South Africa. And, uh, debate and divestment movement. I wrote a long book about it. And one of the ironies was that after fighting the idea of South African divestment for years, uh, some of the banks, when they finally saw that it was tilting away and that people, they suddenly, same bank, within a few weeks, suddenly put a big ad in New York Times saying, Are you looking to invest your funds in a South Africa free uh, fund? Join our South Africa free equity safe fund. We are the leaders in this field. So they completely abandoned all their resistance, and they switched over to wanting to benefit from it. So uh, it's, a, it's a puzzle. Um, 
I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to this. Yeah. It's um, reading uh, Clayton Christensen's books about uh, disruptive innovation seems very parallel to what you're saying, which right. is the and and a lot of times the big organization is toppled by uh, the small starting thing that looked insignificant to them because they were ignoring it, and sometimes they pick up on it, sometimes they don't. IBM happened to pick up on the personal computer because somebody designed the spreadsheet program for it, and IBM said, oops, <laughs> I guess we better make one. Um, but that ha that's unusual. In a lot of cases, the big industry, you're right, disappears because it can't, it can't figure out what to do until it's too late. Uh, Clay, Clay Christensen is a really interesting professor at Harvard Business School, for those of you who may not be familiar with writing constantly about disruptive technology. Yeah? So I have a question kind of building on that events, um, looking at GAR strategies. So, it's around crisis transformation, and I think this is something that I've thought about a lot. Um, so you were saying earlier that, that, that unlike the kind of old economy movement, which has a very hegemonic um, dogma, basically, about how the economy works in a very coherent theory, that the new economy is, is this kind of process of becoming, and it's all of these different experiments, and it's, it's decentralized, in a sense, and that's part of what's different about it. Um, so how, like, how does the movement come up with the thing that can be offered in the moment of crisis transformation that's coherent enough to replace the previous paradigm when part of the whole zeitgeist of the movement is that it doesn't have a kind of monolithic yeah, ideology like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, exactly. Um, again, no easy answer, but I think what you want to be doing is incubating as many great ideas as you can. Um, one of the reasons we're making this shift from New Economics Institute to New Economic Coalition is that we began to feel that there were a lot of institutes working on great stuff. We had 27 institutes and think tanks come to the Bard College Conference. We had 56 university programs uh, focused on different pieces of this. So it's a really excellent question, uh, it, it, but it's not something that you can answer by saying, oh, we're all going to rally around one think tank and we're going to support them. What you have to do is just keep, I mean, boy, the <laughs> biggest problem is people not asking the question that will really drive change. I mean, pessimism or de de sort of depletion of hope is a strategy to preserve the status quo. Mm -hmm. So that's why having people say, no, we could do it this way, we could do it that way, we could do it that way, and trying to get it off the ground um, is so incredibly valuable. And I think we could take a page from some of the, let's say, internet entrepreneurs who are thinking about one very narrow form. We need an increasing form of movement entrepreneurs who say, let's pull things together and, uh, and tackle this. I, I'm, I'm sensing that. Rachel, you might have something to say about this. You. But, I mean, the only, the only thing that I would add is that I think, um, you know, we struggle with this a lot when we talk about things like mapping the new economy, right? because at that point you're charged with coming up with criteria about what it is and what it isn't. Um, and that has happened in as many different ways as there are maps. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the ways that it's been most successful is to sort of say, these are the values that we would like to uphold in our new economic system. And it's up to you to self-identify as being a part of that. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's an incredibly important piece of movement building, is empowering people to self-identify. Um, and so I think if we are able to both cultivate a wide variety of alternatives, but also provide the space for them to step up and say, yes, I am a part of this. That's also, by the way, what this 50,000 person rally in DC was about this past weekend. It's all these various people who are related to the climate movement in so many different ways and have and fall in many different places along the ideological spectrum. But that was a space that was provided for all of them to feel comfortable stepping into it and saying, I'm a part of this. Um, and so I think that, that um, that's an incredibly important piece of it. Yeah. I have a question, um, which is that it, it seems like this sort of um, way that you're talking about the new economy is like m lots more of the same and be louder and more visible. Like we said, like more credit unions, more land trusts, like all of these different sort of this patchwork, this checkerboard of things that we're doing. We need more of it and to connect better with each other. And the thing that I don't think you said was to talk about unions, mm. like this really st strong, was stronger sort of institution in the United States. 
And it seems to me that it, it's sort of a paradox because unions are out there to support their members. And if their members, like for example in New York City, big clash about unionizing um, uh, fast food chains because if you have union, a unionized fast food chain, yay, people who work in the fast food chain, but then that union is going to go to bat for that fast food chain. So all of a sudden you have this whole group of people that are maybe natural enemies of the food chain, or of the, um, of the fast food <laughs> uh, chain, um, but who are then advocating for it, in it you know, so they can keep their jobs. Same thing happens with unions in the nuclear, um, building nuclear facilities, you know, very high paid jobs, for example. So, um, I'm just curious sort of what your approach is to um, engaging with unions. Well, I was uh, part of a really interesting conversation organized by a wonderful union leader named Joe Uline, who's head of something called the Labor Network for Sustainability. And um, his uh, mission, uh, he used to be the director of strategic campaigns for the AFL-CIO, and as that, that, he was at the pointy end of the stick of m so many major debates. Uh, you've identified a really serious issue. First of all, as uh, I'm really high on Gar's book because I just finished it, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know he talks about that the classic progressive model uh, that worked all the way through the 30s, from the 30s through relatively recently, is that um, corporate power, economic power, would be counterbalanced through countervailing force. And countervailing force, as John Kenneth Galbraith talked about, were unions, well-organized unions that, so, you know, corporations want to suppress wages, unions want to push wages up, and you have a big battle and the and government kind of tries to find a middle ground between them and so forth. Uh, unions are dropping like a stone in terms of membership uh, as part of the general uh, problem of manufacturing. And so, uh, and they are all over the place in relation to sustainability question. You have, you know, the steel workers who are very gung-ho. Uh, you have the, the, I was surprised that the really key example what you mentioned were the mine workers and the mine workers who uh, want to defend the mining, the, the, the fundamental support for mining communities uh, that represents the difference between total impoverishment and some kind of uh, standard of living, but also means continuing to, to um, uh, you know, churn out large amounts of coal. Here's another interesting statistic I just looked at. Um, do you know how many coal miners there are in the United States? There's only 82,000 which to me sounded like a small number of people distributed over a wide number of states. The largest numbers in West Virginia, they're 20,000 people. But if you think about that, the whole, a huge piece of the climate debate is around what do you do about these 80,000 people? And it's not, not an insubstantial problem. But it's also not, I mean, at one point GM had 400,000 people working for it, not anymore. But, you know, so the scale issue is it. So I think there's no way around this but really serious dialogue. Um, one of the, the, the classic things that you have in any political struggle is pitting people who ought to be allies against each other. So you had, um, you know, in Wisconsin, you had um, uh, retirees being pitted against public workers, being pitted against teachers, being pitted against, and the only way you can get around that is by bringing people in the room and saying, no, we're not going to be set off against each other, we're going to figure out a way, as Rachel was saying, to talk about a just, fair, sustainable economy that meets the needs for everyone. And that kind of work is really, really hard work. Um, so I partially answered your question. Um, uh, unions are struggling now to redefine their role uh, and particularly to rethink the role of work in the new economy. I mean, as productivity rises and the amount of available work goes down and fewer people have the opportunity to get jobs because we now can make things with machines, this is a really, or we can export them, this is a really fundamental question union bargaining power drops, union uh, membership drops. And so um, that's a lot, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I, you, you put your finger on a key thing. So I'm particularly interested in Anna's question, so I'm gonna come at it again, maybe from a slightly different angle, just Hope because I'm interested. Have a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in pushing kind of the envelope. Sure. Um, so in the documentary Food Incorporated, 
they're interviewing the CEO of Stonyfield Farms. Right. And so it's a big organic deal, things are really good for this company, and then there's a lot of people who are critical of the CEO because they decided to sell to Walmart. Right. Everybody hates Walmart in the business. And so some people see that as the organic movement, you know, the farm to table movement being co-opted by this giant organization that nobody really likes. So, I mean, I, I kind of see this as an analogy to the unions and fast food. It's true of Whole Foods, too. Right, right. This is happening all over the place. And so, kind of referencing what you were mentioning a little earlier, you are saying there's some people who see it as, like, we have to do as much under the radar as we can before the big guys notice, and then we overthrow them. You know, that might be one way to think about it. But another way to think about it is, you know, reaching your hands across the political aisle and, like, combining or collaborating with the people who you may have been opposed to in almost all situations. So I guess my question from a different angle is, do you see the direction the new economy is going as eventually collaborating with the other side, the old economy, or is it really going to be like an overthrow? What's the other side? The other side being like the old guard, old economy, old economic models that if there, we are in the process of say making new indicators, if GDP doesn't work anymore, if there is this new indicator, is this new indicator something that comes from a completely new angle, or do the new people then collaborate with the old people to make something Yeah, that's a really fascinating about it. Let me just uh, raise a very specific example of this, which is um, in this work of the uh, integrated reporting, um, the question is who are we reporting for and why? And without reproducing two years of very detailed technical and frustrating discussion, the question boiled down to, are we talking about sustainability as a way to make more money for investors, or are we talking about sustainability as, as investment, as a process of transforming companies so that they're more sustainable? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really, that's like, who is in the driver's seat, capital or, uh, the planet, so to speak, sustainability. <laughs> I don't know if you remember Inconvenient Truth. Uh, 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 Al Gore uh, uh, spoofed George Bush, who was talking about the trade-offs between the planet and, and, and economic activity, and he said, you know, this is, a, and he had a visual, and it was the visual of a balancing weight, and on the one side was the whole planet, and the other side was a bunch of gold bars. And he was saying, you know, first President Bush was saying, you know, we really have to weigh whether we want economic activity, and Al Gore said, yeah, gold bars versus the entire planet. That's the, <laughs> that's the debate that we're having. But the, the, um, to come back to your question, transformation, I mean, I think is, is the pathway that I see. Others may see a different form. There, and a lot of it has to do with the control and distribution and, uh, of capital. Um, and I don't mean, you know, you either have capitalism as we have to, or you have state socialism where everything is owned, but there have to be a whole variety of semi-democratic or fully democratic alternatives that allow interest to be introduced to the disposition and deployment of capital other than simply ram it in and try and produce the greatest possible return. Um, and so, um, and there are some industries, you know, if you look at a list of the big industries in the United States, some of them are very capital intensive. I mean, we have done a lot of work in Western Mass and the Berkshires and doing all kinds of great things out there, but we're not going to build a 747 in the Berkshires. This is a highly te technical, complex, uh, capital intensive process. So some industries are going to lend themselves to the more distributed new economy, smaller scale activity service industries, hospitality, but at the same time we're combating this force of concentration and capital intensivity um, and, and increased productivity at the expense of uh, people. And that's just, that is an ongoing struggle. Right now, however, it's being won by the capital intensivity people. And that's because capital is seen as so fungible. You, you know, raise a hundred million dollars and you can do almost anything you want with it. So, so anyway, just come back to exploring alternative democratic structures, that is, uh, uh, d uh, diversified ownership, diversified control, diversified forms of financing, government engagement in financing. These are pathways that, frankly, are already in existence, but they do need to be intensified 
in order to meet those structural crises that we're headed to, this isn't just a political struggle, uh, it's a political struggle in the face of these much larger problems that are coming at us whether we are aware of them or not. Um, I'm not aware of the time. Are you aware? How yeah. Are we going to uh, we're, so it's 1:30 now. If people have to take off, that's fine. We, you know, advertise as 12:30 to 1:30, but we actually book this room till two. And if you're willing to stay around for another 15 or 20 minutes, or we can wrap. Well, I can up tell you, two. as anybody knows me, that no known limit to Bob Massey's ability to talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Then whoever would like to continue this conversation can stay for another half an hour before. Um, there's a particularly grouchy professor who won't. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, everything's fine. Yeah. 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 I'll but, cut it. Have, Thank like, you. Minutes, so that we have time to clean up and get out of here for the next class. Yeah. No, I'm um, forever. Well, one of the things that concerns me or I find troubling oftentimes when we're speaking within the United States context is that there's this sort of imaginary boundary around the U.S. economy as if it were a unit separated from this global context. And particularly if we're concerned about questions of inequality and questions of environmental sustainability, I think it's impossible to ignore how interrelated economies are across states, across borders, across regions, however you want to think about it. Um, and so I was hoping you could speak to that a little bit, because as much as I value small scale and thinking about credit unions and land trusts and things like that, those are ultimately functional, functioning at a smaller scale than we're talking about if we're thinking about oil or we're thinking about free trade, things like that. So I was hoping you could touch on that a little bit and how those questions are being addressed within the new economy movement. Well, they're not being addressed particularly well because in a certain sense the new economy movement is a response to globalization and to the, uh, the accelerating problems created by globalization. And it is very frustrating. As somebody who's done a lot of international work, I can say um, I remain very troubled that um, we have 4% of the world's population and we act as though we have 86% of the world's population. We control, you know, we put out 20 something percent of the emissions and we, uh, you know, so there's an enormous uh, disproportionate uh, effect, but it's matched by what you addressed, which is uh, by just a lack of awareness. And I think um, one of the reasons, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but one of the reasons that I'm uh, engaged with what I do is that um, when I go over to, let's say I'm going to be in Amsterdam in May talking to the Global Reporting Initiative Group, it would be 1,700 people from you know 80 countries, and they say, well, what can most be done about sustainability? Or if I ask them, they're going to say, teams of the United States, because the patterns, economic <laughs> patterns, uh, cultural patterns, political patterns in the United States uh, continue to be mimicked around the world and seen as leadership positions. So um, this is a this is an indirect answer to your question that as we demonstrate the capacity to imagine alternative, I mean you know the, the massive bone crushing um, uh, corporation is a post World War II invention. I mean it was around in the 19th century, but the particular globalized form of it is post World War II. Um, the other thing is that um, the, to return to Rachel's question about values, I mean, one of the things that has been very, uh, it's a small action, but it is uh, is the way in which the internet and other activities have allowed us to address international questions of justice, worker rights, supply chains, uh, environmental consequences. So. Um, in particular industries, people, American consumers, coffee being an example, uh, have been able to say, we are not willing just to take coffee at the absolute cheapest price. We're willing to pay a premium because we're aware we have a sophistication. This has also happened among clothing and footwear and in other areas. So um, the, the new economy, as we've been talking about today, is primarily a homegrown reestablishing a center of power uh, and activity relative to globalized corporations um, operating around the world. That doesn't mean it isn't connected to globalization, it just is, it has, it has not been its current focus. But this is still a new movement. And, um, uh, and particularly around issues like climate, you cannot address uh, the climate question without immediately asking huge questions about global production and consumption. Yeah. 
Um, so, first, thanks again so much for coming and for bringing so much of your fantastic team. Um, I had two questions. You were sort of listing off a lot of the different sort of words that people are using to describe all these different types of movements within the new economy. So right. collaborative consumption, the sharing economy, gift economy. I'm wondering, just as you were saying that this is a new movement, how you feel like those sort of sub sub groups within the new economy, how all these different words we're using to describe it are either helping people conceive of the different tools people are using or confusing people about what it is we're really talking about. Um, and then the second part of my question is sort of around how many of those terms I feel have been already co-opted by your example of sort of Bank of America is the new economy. Um, I feel like that has already happened particularly with Collaborative consumption, when you were talking about sort of what is the, is it is it driven by values or is it driven by capital? And I think that there's really this sense that, oh, this is actually just a great way to make a lot of money. I don't know whether or not that's a problem, but I'm wondering how you see these terms being used and some of the challenges around that. That's a great question. Um, I mean, in the end, as in all really big debates, this comes down to the sophistication and wisdom of the people. Can they be duped into thinking that all forms of new economy are the same, or do they have a sense of this driving values that they want to see implemented and that they are willing to expend some of their own uh, energy uh, achieving? Um, you know, I, I do think there's an interesting generational question here. I was, um, I have two sons uh, in their 20s and, and a teenage daughter, and um, uh, you know, I'm not generalizing just from them, but but the, but there, I was talking to Rebecca Henderson, who used to be here at MIT, is now over at Harvard Business School, and we were discussing the pattern of her generation, my generation, where the sort of progression was towards ownership. You know, you started off with something and then what you want to do is own a car or own a house or, you know, own a, a, a garage full of stuff that you don't use. Um, and uh, uh, she was saying that uh, her uh, sense, based on some research that she had done, is that people of your generation, broadly speaking, are less interested in the ownership part and much more interested in the use part. So as somebody said, you don't want the drill, you want the hole. <laughs> and um, and if you can get the whole by t different methods other than owning the drill, that's going to work out great. And I do see this reflected in my kids and their friends. They are not, you know, I mean, uh, when I was a young man, you know, owning a car was a huge big status symbol and you were driving forward to try and get a car as soon as you could and neither one of my sons wants to own a car anytime soon. They see it as a huge, you know, environmental and financial drain. And um, now, look, they're just, you know, it's just one thing, but if cultural, I mean, cultural values drive so much of what we actually do and the decisions we make, that as people in your position become institutional leaders and political leaders and so forth, uh, these ideas that everybody has to own every, one of everything and you have to have, you know, in eight houses you have to have eight snowblowers. Um, instead of having one snowblower that eight houses would share, that those things will shift, consumption patterns will shift. Um, so, um, as, to go back to the first part of your question, uh, the the names are a bit confusing. I can tell you, particularly to funders, they're like, who's doing what, and this doesn't fit with our usual understanding of policy-driven change. But I don't think that's too bad. For some people, the solidarity question, which goes back to labor, and uh, is the key the key feature. For us, other people, sustainable. For other people, the collaboration, that essential um, form of exchange and gifting. Um, for some people, the moral content of caring is the key component. And they tie that to a whole range of other moral issues or feminist principles or whatever. You know, that the, 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 the thing that's missing from our economy is the principle of caring. So calling it a caring economy re-enshrines re those things. Um, I think the new economy is um, in some ways a misnomer because part of what we're trying to do is restore things that have been lost. But there's also a sense that it's new in that we are trying to get away from this increasing mega structure of 
of everything. We've kind of, I mean, you know, after the merger of American Airlines and uh, US Air, we have three big airlines in the United States. That's crazy, crazy thing. We're just going to see prices go straight up again. You know, amazingly, all the prices are going to be exactly the same because of oligopolistic signaling. So, um, anyway, I'm kind of, I suppose, reaching the end of my time because I'm starting to link everything to everything else. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think the name, we're at the point where the names allow people to attach themselves according to their particular values to this core idea. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> Bob, thanks very much for your very important remarks. I teach a course here on sustainability and transformation. Some of the people here have taken that course. I'd like as many of you would like to take it to take it, but let me... Um, I've taken it. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got five comments, and they're not meant in terms of criticism. One is that we're about to, to witness a, a mini-battle with the union supporting fracking and the pipeline and environmentalists being against it. I mean, I think we have to watch very, very carefully how that plays out. And if you're not already doing it, you all aren't already doing it. There's got to be a way to talk to the unions about the fact that, for example, the jobs that are likely to emerge from that are likely to be temporary because they're likely to be installing the pipes. And I'm not sure that the unions really get it and I'm not sure we're offering them a way out. So here's a mini problem, but one that really is terribly symbolic because we don't know which way Obama's going to go. Secondly, um, and this goes to the writing of Speth and, and other friends, I think that you have to ask whether we are over-romanticizing the bottom-up effectiveness. Exciting to be with people who think like you do, but out there in the, in the larger world, uh, there aren't a lot of people listening. And uh, what I find interesting is almost an absence of the role of government in these issues, which people can argue, oh, it's top down. Well, top down never worked. Well, actually, it has worked. And I think uh, the thing, if I were to critique anything about the movement, that's uncomfortable for me. It's that there's too much over romanization. Of, of, of the cultural change that may not be enough, may be a necessary but not a sufficient condition. The other was to respond to a question about whether you know, there's a globalized economy and so forth and so on. Yeah, but actually examples of countries that are doing it right, like Norway or Denmark or in some cases Holland, could be the way that we change the system. I mean, if Vermont, for example, decides to do things right and starts to have corporate charters of a different nature and so forth and so on, and, and a tax of the right things rather than the wrong things, not taxing labor anymore, but taxing pollution. People could look over the border and say, hey, wait, I want one of those. I want what's going on in Oregon. So I think, in a sense, we're nationalized. We focus on nationalizing <coughs> CNN. We focus on fighting the national battle. But maybe the battle is going to be won at the regional or state level, and maybe a judicious choice of transforming Michigan or Illinois would be a much more important thing to do because when people see that the system can work, it's not an idea, it's a fact. So any anyway, that's one comment. And I think separate venues and separate ideas and separate experimentation might be more impar more more powerful than engaging in the debate. And finally, I, I want to add a word which is, <coughs> I think after worrying about the sustainability issue for so long, the most crucial thing to do is to reform the press. Because the press gives equal space and equal time to unequally meritorious ideas. On the one hand, global climate change exists, on the other hand it does. Inches are the same, minutes are the same, you wonder why. 42% of the people still can't make up their mind about it. But the press is owned by vested interest. It's, I mean, in Britain, at least, we've taken Murdoch to the coals. We've not done anything with Murdoch here. He's buying the Los Angeles Tribune. He's, I mean, he's <coughs> the monopoly power. And I mean, we don't have a left-wing press, in case any of you were under, 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 under illusions. 
I was once invited to, when things were hot between the environmental and the labor movement, to address the AFL CIO and I. They said, What's the single most important thing you could do to shift what was going on at that time to environmentalists and labor? I said, Buy USA Today hmm. or buy CNN. I mean, I almost think that if you don't have, and this argues against the local activity, but it's, it's a parallel concern, if you don't have a major organ of information dissemination, these guys are too smart and too fast and too there first to be able to counter that. So if you can collect money and buy USA Today, who by the way would not sell to the labor unions, or CNN where Turner really betrayed his values by selling it to whom it was. It's only one notch better, notch better than Fox News, as you know, if you watch the, the program. But if you don't have a major press outlet, you can't work on the culture as a whole. So those are my observations from having thought about it. Um, they're all <laughs> excellent. I, I just want to make one quick point following up on about romanticizing the bottom line and the role of government. Um, I think, uh, you know, we didn't address that here, but it is remarkable to see what's happening uh, and the course that was in here right before is at the, at the level of mayors, for example. Mayors are pursuing a, an extraordinary range of new solutions. This is partly a generational thing, it's partly a practical thing. They've been backed into a corner where they're no longer going to get uh, a lot of uh, largesse. So, you, so yes, a uh, great phrase from Randall Robinson of the uh, leader in the anti-apartheid movement who said, if you want politicians to lead, you form a parade and they find their way to the front. <laughs> and so, so part of what we're in the business of is creating parades that, and then, and then you and, uh, echoed and, and, and uh, uh, embellished on the checkerboard idea, you know, that if we can find examples, then people will look around and say, I want to do that too. And so um, there are some reasons to be hopeful. Um, buying a major uh, press thing, that would be a great Kickstarter campaign, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, what? I was laughing at you. Crowdsurfing, money crowd to buy, CNN. Buy <laughs> Amount desired, seven billion. <laughs> but no, these are all really important things. The good, the good news is, the bad news is they're all intertangled and complicated. The good news is they're all intertangled and complicated so that when you start to make progress in one area, you start to, uh, you can have beneficial um, effects. But I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, I hope that you will stay engaged. I really want to urge uh, you and others to invite Joe Uline to come up and address the labor question. U uh, e h l e i n, wonderful, thoughtful man. You know, started his career um, pouring concrete in Pennsylvania, um, building nuclear power plants as a 19-year-old, and then has come through an incredible labor and sustainability career. Um, so, and I know he would love to come, and you would learn a huge lot <coughs> from him. Um, so, and thank you, and I hope that uh, we just go from strength to strength. And, uh, yeah, yeah.